Welcome to Diffuse Congruence. This is episode 133 of the American Muslim Experience. I am your host, Pervez Ahmed, and I am joined by our show's co-host, Omar Ansari. Assalamu alaikum, Pervez. Assalamu alaikum, listeners. It has definitely been a minute. I think we last recorded in Ramadan. Actually, we recorded before Ramadan, wow. a little uh, peek behind the curtain, but the show dropped in Ramadan. Okay, You're so right. it's definitely and been a while. Yeah, it has been a while. It's definitely been a while. But uh, yeah, and we apologize, but as I, I think I said on one of the socials, you know, life has a way of getting in the way. Umar and I have jobs and families and we're juggling all of that. In fact, this very episode with our esteemed guests had to be rescheduled. I think this is the third time we've tried to do this. <laughs> Thank you so much to our guest for working with us here. And our guest for this episode is Sheikh Jabir Therin, who is a registered associate marriage and family therapist. Um, he has served as a teacher at several Islamic institutions, including Dua Se a Seminary, where he teaches the Islamic sciences and Noor Institute. Sheikh Jabir has previously served as a therapist and spiritual and religious leader through the Muslim Mental Health Initiative at UC Berkeley and served the greater community through the Khalil Center. Currently, he passionately maintains similar roles through Wasila Connections, which I really want to talk about, as his other affiliates. Uh, Sheikh Jabber's professional interests include providing mental health and spiritual training to, to the city of Fremont and beyond, uh, integrating Islamic spirituality with mental wellness, and teaching Islamic theology to young adults and college students. So we are delighted to have have Sheikh Jabber on the show. Thank you so much. Yeah, and and I've yeah. been hearing your your name, Sheikh, for many years. Uh, whether it was through Khalil Center, and then uh, coincidentally, we were scheduled to speak. I know uh, to have this recording about a month ago, and literally just the day before, you were at much of the Noor and talking about some of the things you want to see in a marriage. And uh, that was literally just the day before. And then we, we actually had a chance to meet up after that, get to know each other. But regardless, super excited to have you here. Welcome. Alhamdulillah. Jazakumullah khairan for having me. Uh, well, pleasure to be here with you all. Yeah, no. Uh, and uh, thank you again, as I mentioned at the outset, for working through all of our uh, snafus with rescheduling and whatnot. So just based on your bio, bio I, I, I get the impression you are a Bay Area native. Are you born That's and right. raised? That's right. Yeah, okay. born and raised uh -huh. um, in Fremont. And funny enough, I was born here, raised here, grew up here, moved out of town for a little while. So about seven years, moved to Modesto, about an hour and a half away, uh, came back, did college here, uh, grad school, finished my formal Islamic education here as well, got married here, had kids here. So definitely Bay Area native. Got it. And where does your family hail from? You're like, where, where, where's your sort of family yeah, background? Yeah, so uh, backgrounds from Afghanistan. So okay. mother and father are from uh, immigrants from Afghanistan. But of course, I was born here. They and came in the 80s? or That's right. Okay. So they came in uh, one of those earlier waves um, okay. in the early 80s. And as a matter of fact, my parents got married here uh, in California in the Bay Area. I don't know what it's been, but this is uh, not by design, but our third consecutive guest that we've had from the motherland. So uh, <laughs> you follow the heels of Hussain Mujaddidi, who of course is Afghan, uh, and then also Sheikha uh, Muslima Pramel. Uh, down Got in Southern it, California, yeah. although she was visiting when we recorded, but it just so yeah. happens we've had a slew of right. uh, Afghani uh, or, or children of Afghani immigrants, I should say. But uh, big family, uh, yeah, yeah. So I, my own, we have uh, I have three three brothers, one older, two younger, and I'm smack dab in the middle. Mm. Um, but definitely big family. So in, in terms of relatives, cousins, my mom has seven sisters, two brothers. Um, my father's side is a little bit smaller, but overall, it turns out to be a big family. So our get-togethers were your pretty traditional big uh, immigrant family get-togethers. And that's, a, that's you know, uh, Hosai Mujadidi was talking about this, just the experience growing up in the Bay Area with a big family and some of the blessings of, of that. Maybe I'd love to hear about your, your youth. I mean, did you feel like you were surrounded by people you could relate to, whether it be cultural or religiously, or, or was it more of an, an adjustment? No, not at all. I think for me personally, it was very organic and mm -hmm. it felt, I think we're in a very peculiar part of town being here in the Bay Area relative to the rest of the country uh, with the Afghan population in particular, because right. there are so many other Afghans here That's right. that it never really felt alien to me. Mm. Uh, and I know that my experience may be unique to me because I know certainly other people have had different experiences, but for me in particular, I think the, and maybe perhaps we'll get into this a little bit later, but I think for me being a American 
born Afghan family, Muslim faith person. Um, the only challenge with that was making all three of those make sense at the same time. But in terms of my growing up and whether or not I felt sort of like I belonged here or I felt like I'm not from here, not at all. I think for me, it was very comfortable growing up because one, we had a big Afghan family, so everybody integrated. I had people, cousins, relatives, same age as me. Hmm. So that also made it feel really, it normalized the experience. Um, and then just a bunch of my friends also similar backgrounds. So it felt very good to me. It felt very organic. Was that um, exodus to California or I guess out of Afghanistan, California being like a big destination, it seems like that was something that had predated the 80s. Do you know? You know, to be honest, okay. it's, it's always been one of those things where I've, I've loved to explore like why here yeah, and yeah. why did everyone decide to come here and how did that happen? Because, um, um, I mean, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, but I mean, because uh, Hosai's experiences very much echo yours because she also grew up here in a big community, felt very organic and didn't feel any sort of sense of, I mean, outside of the, you know, usual as an immigrant or a child of, or, you know, ch child of immigrant. But like, for example, Muslim, Sheikh Muslim, she grew up. In Ra 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 Raleigh, Raleigh yeah. but Raleigh. but 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 the family wanted to make their way out to the west because uh, you know they had heard of this big diaspora of Afghani settling in the Bay. No, not just the Bay Area, but in California it's in about, general. And I think specific to like Fremont, right? I oh think yeah, Fremont I mean, and Virginia is what I've heard had the largest yeah, had right, the largest yeah. communities. Right, maybe that's had right. the largest. I mean, people know this, but or because we, we've mentioned this on the show, but you know, Fremont is known as you know Little Gobble or Fremontistan. We literally <laughs> just had Afghani food. Oh yeah, uh, that's just right. to kind of kick off the <laughs> evening before recording. Apropos of everything, yeah. Hubs um, the certified, by the way. But we'll get to that. <laughs> we will get to that, <laughs> For sure. uh, and then we yeah. have the right person to talk to about that. Um, so yeah, oh, but, yeah, I think that'd be a fascinating thing for uh, for exploration. I'm, I'm yeah, sure definitely, and yeah. I think it's one of those things mm -hmm. as well for uh, for me. Uh, you know, having grown up in the early 90s to see the the way that the Afghan community developed also. Yeah. Um, I think the early 80s, the age in which my mom had come to this country, she was much younger. She actually went to high oh, school here. Okay. Um, she went to college here. So she's uh, educated uh, in, in the secular sense as well yeah. as in the religious sense. But I think that the interesting thing in, in particular for me was that number one, there was a, a huge wave of Afghans who came specifically to this part of the country. And then the second thing is, is how close they were together, meaning mm. in physical proximity to one another. Oh, I see. The real sort of waves of people starting to move outward and going towards Tracy or Sacramento, et cetera, actually happened closer to the, the early to mid 2000s. So you got to understand, like for the for at least 10, 20 years, people were very close together within the Tri-City general area. Now, when we say Tri-City, just for those- Fremont, outside, yeah. Hayward, Union City, you know, part of the East Bay, right. um, Northern California. So for, 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 for the largest part, you had a bunch of people in real close proximity to one another. And then as the population grew and as the community got bigger, uh, people started to have children and those kids got bigger, then folks started to to mm. move out. And now you'll see that there are Afghans in almost every part of the uh, Northern California. Yeah. So as far as north as Sacramento, um, as far south as, you know, South San Jose, Gilroy, you know, you're still finding Bakersfield even, you're still finding that there. So in Fremont or the Tri-Cities, as you said, uh, specifically, what is one of the oldest sort of masjids or Islamic centers? Do you know? Yeah. So there is used to be a central uh -huh. masjid uh -huh. called uh, Masjid Bila. And this was like, I think, and I, you know, I don't want any of the, the veterans to, you know, get upset with me. So, um, but it was one of the first original Afghan masjids, quote unquote, you know, and that was the masjid that most of the Afghan communities to get together. And that was, I believe, on Paseo Padre. It was in a shopping center. Oh. Uh, it was a small, small little retail location. Got it. And then from there grew Masjid Abu Bakr, um, a Siddiq in Hayward, mm -hmm. then grew Masjid Ibrahim Khalilullah in Fremont. And so the Masjid started to grow Masjid Mahajideen as well. These are some of the classic Masjids that sort of sprung out from that um, central community. Okay. Again, I know we're talking to listening segment that lis that lives or is familiar with the Bay Area, but I'm fascinated by that. Yeah. Just, so I, I guess, you know, by extension, then 
or from that, if you could talk maybe a little bit about not just your own family, but maybe that wave of immigrants that came from Afghanistan, what is sort of the religious outlook, if you will? I mean, pr- relatively practicing, n- you know, not so much secular. Yeah, I think there was definitely, you know, and again, I want to be respectful to all my elders because I'm, I totally acknowledge that I'm a bit on the younger side relative uh, to the to the folks who you know, that first batch of people. You you, you um, wanted to say relative to us, but you were no, very no. respectful. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yeah, no, I mean, the, 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 the reality is, is that I uh, can't speak to that entire population only because um, I wasn't old enough. I didn't grow up with being mm-hmm. familiar with that first wave and yeah. what their experience was like. I can speak to my family. I can speak to those within my network and my uh, sort of group. Yeah. And I know that a lot of the Afghans that did come were very cognizant of their faith. They were very aware. They were identifiably uh, Muslim in that they practiced, you know, they prayed, they had their Ramadan, they had their Tarawih. As a matter of fact, Tarawih used to be at Shabo College in Hayward. They would rent out the gymnasium and they would have one of the famous, uh, one of the most famous Qurra of uh, Afghanistan, Qari Barakatullah Salim. They would actually invite him <clears throat> and he would come and he would lead the Tarawih prayers. And that is my earliest memory of Tarawih, I think, ever, uh, is praying there with him, behind him at Shabo College in Hayward. I think it's a mixed bag, though. I can certainly say that it's a mixed bag. You had, you know, Afghans from all backgrounds, those with various different sort of uh, allegiances, you can say, because uh, the whole idea of the Afghans and leaving Afghanistan during that early 80s was due to the Soviet-Afghan war. So you had Afghans on the Soviet side mm. oh. you, and you had Afghans on the on the religious side that leaving for their safety and their the religious freedoms. Yeah. And so you, you did have a mixed bag for sure. And then that, of course, further developed um, as people sort of realized, hey, we're not, we're, we're no longer in a Muslim country. We're no longer in an environment where we can just freely send our kids to schools and expect nothing to happen. You know, I think as young as I, my, my first memory actually of anything Islamic was going to a summer school at Masjid Muhajideen in the early 90s. Maybe I was four or five years old and there was just a bunch of other Afghan kids there at the masjid and there was some Islamic program learning how to recite the qaida and, you know, praying. And uh, there's a lot of funny stories about that. And I don't want to incriminate any of my old teachers or anything, <laughs> but let's just say that the tarbiyah and like the way that, you know, students were reprimanded were reminiscent of back home. <laughs> okay. You know, okay. but uh, it, it was good times and that was some sad. of my uh, yeah. earliest memories of it. Uh, ultimately, of course, mashallah, students, you know, people got older and, you know, people develop in their own ways and their own journeys. Mm, yeah. Yeah. For sure. And, and how about your own personal, like your yeah. experience growing up? What were you always interested in religion? And, and I'm kind of curious how, question. That, yeah. how that journey started. For sure. And I think this is also something I personally enjoy sharing, especially with some of the folks who are kind of trying to figure that out for their own, for their own selves, right? At whatever age or stage they may be in, mm-hmm. you know, and I don't mind even sharing this, but I really, you know, I came from a family where my mom wore the hijab. Uh, we never you know, alcohol was out of the question in our home or, you know, relatives, pork was never on the table. We always ate halal food, but it was sort of, you know, that was kind of it, right? It was never anything beyond that. And I feel like saying that now, like that's a great blessing in and of itself just to have in in one's home, you know, growing up with that. My personal journey actually was that, uh, you know, I went to Quran school, like pretty much anybody else. You went to summer school, Islamic school, then kind of growing up, not really having very much a a deep connection with the masjid yeah. only because at the time the farsi speaking imams spoke a very high caliber farsi and you know me growing up in this country my farsi was much less developed it literally felt like he was speaking another language what was spoken in your home i'm curious it's farsi it but farsi. it's it's uh dari and dari is more of like the uh, language spoken at home right. it's less um eloquent uh, I don't want to say less eloquent, but it's it's less formal, I yeah, should say, yeah, rather. Yeah, sorry. Right, so, right. Um, but so that was the language of the of the home, um, casual speak, and and so colloquial language of the of the com of the common people. So, yeah. the language spoken in the masajid, though, were high level fusha, Farsi, very very um, uh, this much more eloquent and much more uh, proper Farsi. Right. And usually what you'd consider like text textbook Farsi. So in any case, that was sort of difficult for me. And then growing up, I remember, you know, the biggest challenges that I had was 
the typical reminders of pray and and do these things were kind of just like a constant reminder from mom or from dad or go do this or go do this. And there wasn't actual like a direct connection for me. And the way that that happened, I don't mind even, I'm not even embarrassed to share this is that actually I was living in Modesto at the time and I was in high school. And during that time, this was early 2000s. And so our internet went out at home. And so we were left with no communication to the outside world. Cell phones were really not fully that amazing. You pretty much had text message options. Um, and that's about it. It was like those little tiny Nokia phones, you right. know, and stuff like that. So, um, and what ended up happening was, subhanAllah, my mom, she had um, this uh, bookshelf in our loft. There was a book there, uh, What Islam is All About, by an author by the name of uh, Yahya Emmerich. And it was a thick book and it had yeah. colors, uh, it had pages, it had, sorry, pictures, illustrations, highlighted sections. I felt like it was Islam for dummies kind of a book. And I was a young guy. As a matter of fact, I was like 13, 14, actually. So for me, what ended up happening just totally by chance, I just opened up that book because I had nothing else to do. <laughs> and I know that sounds terrible, but what I, I look at that and I say, subhanAllah, Allah no. guided me in the way that was most fitting for me. For sure. And so I uh, opened up this book. I read it cover to cover. In, and it was a fat book, maybe 400 pages. But I read that book cover to cover twice in a week and a half. <laughs> And it was just because I was just, I was just so into it. And that's really sort of how the journey started for me. And again, subhanAllah, you know, it reminds me of that hadith that, you, you know, we learned that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that a person who comes walking to Allah, Allah comes running to them. And I think that that may have been my first few steps, my baby steps to where Allah then came running to me. Mm -hmm. Because it was shortly after that where I received like, you know, a text message from one of my cousins who was living in Hayward at the time. And he says, hey, there's these halaqahs that take place at Masjid Muhajirin. Uh, they're called Hayward Halaqa. There's various scholars. They have pizza. It's a cool event. Just come through. And that didn't appeal to me. I was like, oh, I don't really want to come to the masjid. You know, I don't want to spend my Friday nights there. And then he said, yeah, but all your cousins are here. And I was like, oh, okay, well, that changes everything. And now I'm in Modesto, so still hour 45 minute drive. Yeah. But I think after the first or second time that we found time to go it was from that moment on that you know it, we were hooked like we wouldn't miss a friday night you know it didn't matter what was happening mm -hmm. but we would not miss a friday night so we would make the journey the hour and 40 minute drive every friday um to the best of our ability to try to make and we would make it and there would be days where we would show up and the program ended just because we left late we couldn't make it so we would drive an hour and 45 minutes just mm -hmm. to meet with the speaker right before he left the masjid see some of our friends, see some of our cousins. And then because we're very young and my mom's going to call me and say, hey, where are you? Come home now. Um, we would just spend maybe half an hour there and then drive back home. And that's really sort of where the journey began. What was it about the, um, well, I want to go back to the book too, but what was it about the halakas in particular that spoke to, say, young people on a Friday night? Was it not the the people that you heard at the masjid who spoke that sort of high level, uh, you know, Farsi? That's a good younger question. Speakers? Yeah. So definitely it was the relatability factor. Yeah. The fact that I was able to relate to the plethora of speakers that the organizers brought played a huge role in my own personal sort of connection. Any and particular names that you remember? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So, um, Sheikh Tamim, uh, you know, uh, religious director at Masjid Al Huda in Union City, uh, Dr. Ali Atai from, I think he's still with Zaytuna and he does great work here in, in the Bay Area. Uh, those Imam Zayd Shakir had come. Osama Cannon, actually, uh, Rahimullah, he was one of the speakers. They're a very popular speaker. Mm -hmm. And so we, there was, it was quite a few people that had come um, mm -hmm. there that had caught my attention. Uh, Imam Soheib Webb had come. And they had guest speakers as well. This would be the early 2000s, you said? That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That early early okay. 2000s. I'll, I'll tell you a little side yeah. story. Yeah. So I was, I was newly married and had, I think, either I was, I was living in Fremont. And uh, I remember going to one of those. Because yeah. I was just looking for something. Yeah. And I remember, it, but it was a lot of young kids. There's a lot of 14, 15, 16, 17 year olds. And I was probably 28, 29. Uh, so I was like, oh, maybe not for me. But this is, I felt, I definitely, I remember, I remember going there and, and feeling the energy of the youth. Yeah. And that was something that was very unique about that place. Because at the time, I didn't know this. But of course, looking back, that was one of the few places in all of the Bay Area. Actually, yeah. like probably the entire state. I want to go out on a limb here and say probably all of California really that had that type of draw with students or 
I should say, uh, young Muslims yeah. to the masajid and having that type of a wide variety of scholarship coming and speaking. Yeah, it's true. And so, I, I think nowadays you think about that, you're like, oh no, well, I've heard of this speaker and he's come to my community and he's come. Yeah, but that back then, I don't think they were traveling as much and I don't think that they the globalization factor hadn't really happened with social media. So seeing these people was just, you know, you all you all you know is that you've heard about this person. Oh, Imam Zaid Shakir. Mm. And you're like, oh my gosh. You know, and I remember once somehow the organizers pulled off Sheikh Hamza Yusuf. Yeah. Mm. And Sheikh Hamza came and I mean the masjid was overflowing. People were out in the parking lot, people were out in the streets. Right. And it was but it was an amazing uh, opportunity. And I think it was like you said, that first and foremost, being able to relate to the speakers. Second thing was seeing other people that I knew there. That played a huge role. I didn't want to feel isolated. I didn't want to feel like the odd guy out. So when I would see my cousins were there, other guys in the community that I knew very well, I felt, okay, this is really cool. Like this is kind of that seeing someone encourages someone type thing. So by seeing other people there, for me, it was another form of encouragement. Like I know he'll be there. So I got to be there. And then other people would see me. And then I've heard this now that other people have said to me, I saw you there, so I kept coming. And it's subhanAllah, it's like that chain effect. Going back to the book real quick, um, Yahya Emmerich's book, what was it, do you, do, you, do you recall what was it that drew you to the book? Meaning once you started reading, that was different than the way instruction had been vis-a-vis -vis Islam prior to that. I can't speak to that yeah. whole question, but I can certainly speak to the book itself and say that the book, the way that it was written, I felt like it was for the person who couldn't read very long books of just text. So there was uh, side notes, little bubbles with like a, maybe a small animation, a footnote that had like a funny or a fun, you know, little point, like a fun fact, all related to Islam, mm -hmm. but it was much more palatable for someone like myself who was 13, 14, 15, right. who couldn't. Like if that 400 page book was just 400 pages of text, I would have I probably wouldn't have even opened the book, I think, or okay. I would have opened the book and then I put it right back. So I think the fact that the book had drawings in it, it had images in it, um, it had little snippets in it, little side quests that kept you engaged really is what did it for me. As a matter of fact, I still have that book, the same text is still I think, in my house. Yeah, I think, I think there's something to be said for letting yeah. kids be bored. Yeah, because you mentioned the internet was uh, yeah. not working. Oh, for sure. And now, like, there's very little room or, or to opportunity for kids to be bored. So it could have just been you were blessed with that uh, that that boredom for yeah, a week and a half absolutely. or two. I, I speak to that sometimes when I speak with um with high school age students, for sure. with college students. Yeah. I often say to people, you know, can you be bored? Can you sit in a room and do nothing? You know, I remember I remember summers where weeks would go by and there's just nothing to do. There's literally nothing. We and our we I mean we weren't we didn't come from a family of wealth, mm -hmm. right? So our TVs were those TVs where you'd buy like a ten dollar flea market antenna plug it in the back and hope you get a clear vision. You know, you get a clear image yeah, on yeah. the screen. So that's what we were working with. So like nothing came on until 8 p.m. anyways. So even if you come home, there's nothing to watch. And what you're, you know, what are you going to watch at like eight o'clock at night, hoping to get a clear vision? Yep. Sometimes it's fuzzy, sometimes it's not. And But in any case, yeah, so that boredom, I speak to it quite often. Yeah. I think it's, there's, there's an immense... Wisdom. Um, wisdom in it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So much so. Idle time and just being able to keep yourself occupied and entertain yourself without the assistance of a device or screen is unheard of unfortunately, to young people. Yeah, uh, yeah. And I say that as a father of two teenagers. Yeah, I mean, I um, think uh, well, we a could, year old and just, a as a, just to close yeah. on that, I mean, you know, I remember sitting in the basement reading the Encyclopedia Britannica because there's nothing else to do on a hot summer day, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. You talk about your little bunny ears antenna or bunny ear uh, antenna television. I mean, we grew up in a world where it was three, you had three channels yep. that turned off at midnight. So, you know, now you have, you know, on demand at your fingertips 24-7. So, so there's a lot to be said of that, I yeah. think. But so anyway, how, how yeah. Did, so how, now, how yeah. did this result in actual yeah. path on to scholarship? So was, there's a lot in between that, uh, right? Yeah. So um, essentially that continued the visits and for years, you know, going to the Hayward Halaqa and going there and meeting scholars and sitting with the scholars and seeing people who are same age as you and seeing what paths they're taking in life. Some are older, some are younger. Ultimately, what happened was I think of all the speakers that came, I started to draw an affinity to some more, more than others. And that's exactly what happened for me personally, that I started to, 
you know, every week was supposed to be a different speaker. And it did happen in that way where there was a different speaker every week, every Friday evening. But it just so happened that when Sheikh Tamim would come, he's also Afghan, spoke very eloquent English, shared anecdotal anecdotes about his life or stories about the religion, etc., that were captivating, they were motivating, they were engaging. Of course, the fact that he also knew the there was a cultural effect as well, which right. is we come from the same cultural background. We shared those same similar uh, messages and stories and those incidents that took place in our childhood growing up. So similarities in that also drew me closer to him in particular. And what ended up happening is that I think I because I got closer to him, in terms of my understanding of scholarship and thinking and knowing that religion requires that, a, you know, there's like that teacher to student relationship, you know, and of course I'm doing my own self-study at the same time and I'm learning and it seems like Allah is just sending me down this funnel right. to get from this very broad understanding of the faith to something a little bit more refined, a little bit more refined. Ultimately then saying to myself, I remember sort of making this decision almost for myself that like, if I'm going to connect myself to a scholar or a body of scholars, I want to ensure that it's someone who both I can connect with, but also someone who they're on their dean, their scholarship is rooted in the Sharia, that it's not just someone who can speak very nicely, but also who has the background knowledge as well. And for me, my journey connected me with Sheikh Tamim. As a result, I sort of continued staying with him, going to his programs, going to his talks, going to classes where he was teaching. And as a result, I ended up starting to take uh, Farad Ayn classes, learning my fiqh and my aqidah from him and other of, of his colleagues as well. And that journey sort of continued. He became more of a spiritual guide as well for me, knowledge of ilm al-tazkiyah or ilm al-nafs, learning about purification of the heart getting into those sciences. And that's really what drew me, I think, ultimately to what he was teaching and what he was sharing mm. was that it all made sense. And at the same time, everything was within the borders of the Sharia. Nothing ever stepped outside of the guidelines of the Sharia. And I felt the most confident with that. And so I had my role model in terms of the direction I wanted to go in, in my spiritual journey. Yeah, we've been remiss, unfortunately, uh, not being able to connect with Sheikh Tamim. I mean, I definitely want to have him on the show. Uh, of all the people you've mentioned, in fact, we've had him. We've had them all. They've, they've all been past guests of the show. Well, not Sheikh Hamza, but uh, beyond that, uh, Sheikh Tamim is is really a sort of a missing piece that I definitely want to fix. And hopefully you can make that happen. But I'll even trouble. go so far yeah. as to say this. Yeah. And again, this yeah. is, you guys invited me, so I'm going to share my <laughs> no, mind please do. Uh, and my thoughts. I, I genuinely believe a large part of the young practicing Muslim Afghans in the Bay Area today who are plus or minus my age in their you know mid 30s plus or minus 5 or 6 years or so definitely have uh, Sheikh Tamim to think. Yeah, they can trace it. Mm. To they can Sheikh trace Tamim. it back to him. I, I genuinely believe it because at 100%. at its and and I know that there are people who um, have gone to other places and other scholars and that's mm. fantastic, but definitely I would say a large part of the Afghan community definitely benefited from him. So, in that journey, my own personal education, as it developed further in my spirituality with him, it just so happened that at a certain point, he and his other colleagues announced a full-time Alamiya program. When did that start? Uh, you know, I want to say somewhere in the, around 2010. Okay, that makes sense. Right yeah. around that time, yeah. I want to say, maybe 2009, 2010-ish is when it was, I think, Because announced. at the time, you you, you, you mentioned uh, Masjid Muhajirin, but I mean, that was just one of, uh, I think, a few centers where he was teaching. So he was yeah. at Masjid Muhajirin for the Friday night Hayward Halakas, but for where he was actually sort of teaching out of was Lowry Masjid and Irvington Masjid. And, and, and can I jump in real yeah. quick? For those who are of our listeners who aren't familiar with Sheikh Tamim, yeah. can you just give me a quick 15, 20 second bio of him? Sure, yeah. So he is a um, Afghan resident of the Bay Area. He was originally born in Afghanistan, but he came here when he was very young. So he essentially went through the entire education system here, went to university, San Francisco, San Francisco State. But before completing his uh, education there, decided to take the path of the sacred sciences and completed his Islamic education, both um, partially in South Africa and then the rest of it, the remaining of his Islamic education in Pakistan. Yeah. Then he came back and he was an educator, a teacher, 
And today, currently, he's the uh, resident scholar at Masjid al Huda in Union City. So his training would have been from the uh, Darul Ulum system. That's right. The, the Dars Nizami, Dars Nizami, the Deobandi um, uh, curriculum. That's his background. And so that's the direction I also ultimately went. And so my education, again, just to complete that segment, essentially started with him formally announcing with his colleagues that they're going to have an Alamiya program, which is a part of the Dars Nizami, which is a set of curriculum um, developed. Um, in uh, in India uh, by scholars uh, by our by prestigious scholars and it's a system where essentially it covers all of the sharia in approximately 10 years and that was further refined down to eight you know six to eight years in in the current systems and so when that had opened the the program I was actually just out of high school actually so okay. for me I was thinking okay I want to go down this route but it just so happened that my journey started a little bit later than that. So actually, my older brother ended up decided, you know, uh, started. To, he enrolled in that program initially. So he enrolled in that program. My younger brother. So I said, okay, well then I'd like to do the hifz of the Quran. I'd like to memorize the Quran. And my mom says, you know what? Your younger brother is a little bit younger than you. He might be a better fit for that. And then I said, well, what am I going to do? She's like, well, you can go to college. <laughs> so it just so happened that I ended up going to college. Okay. And alhamdulillah, I'm grateful yeah, for yeah. it. But I ended up going to college. And going to college, I went to Cal State East Bay in Hayward. I majored in psychology and sociology as a double major. And in my second year... Now, mind you, that first program is ongoing, and now I'm in my second year in undergrad, and Sheikh Lamim says, well, there's been a ton of demand for a part-time program. And I said, absolutely, sign me up. So it was three nights a week, about an hour and a half each night, part-time in one of our you know, good friend's uh, garage. And there was 30 students, all classmates of mine. It was a great time. By the end of the year, there was four people left from 30 to four. And that continued for two years, further getting smaller and smaller, getting refined and more refined um, until there was just myself and one other colleagues left. And now this had been going on for almost three years of part-time. But by that point, there was demand for another batch of full-time students in another Alimiya program. And that class started at Irvington Masjid. And when that class started at Irvington Masjid, the first batch had reached a certain stage where they were, weren't going to complete the six-year curriculum here in America. So after the fourth year, they would actually send students out to various institutions around the world, whether it's South Africa, Pakistan, India, and they would say, complete your education. And that's what happened. So that first batch ended up dispersing. And while they're gone doing the rest, you know, completing their education, this next full-time batch of students, the program began. And in that second batch, we were then requested, myself and uh, my colleague, Sheikh Kothar, to join that program. After one year, I think a little bit of resistance because both our schedules didn't add up. We joined them in their second year, which is full-time, five days a week, you know, Monday through By this time you had Thursday, graduated? Monday through Friday. You had graduated under, undergrad? No. Oh, okay. So I'm still an undergrad. This is like, I think the next year. I think Got I'm it. in my third year at undergrad. So now we're joining this full-time program. And the dates and the, you know, the timeline might be a little bit off here, but I'm just sure, sharing no, no, sort no. of what happened. I don't remember the the exact dates or how when it happened, but well, that's one, what happened. One thing, uh, Parvez, that I picked up with Sheikh Jabber is he, he's a good multitasker. He's very productive. He can do a lot of things at once. So. <laughs> that was a different time. You know, <laughs> I feel like when you're in college, yeah. there's a, you, you feel like you can do everything. That, you yeah, know? yeah, good point. So there's that Jewish, you know, there's just that yeah. excitement and that right. vigor. So that's really what happened. So I would, I'm in undergrad, I'm in my third year, double major, and now I'm taking this full-time Alamiya course, which is Monday through Friday. So by then, um, and this is where Omar is going to have to reel me in because I can get into the weeds, but I, I have to. Uh, inside just, baseball. I, I can't resist. Inside baseball, there you go. Is having done it part-time for what, three years by then? Just about, yeah. Where, where, where would you maybe place yourself if you were say, studying at a Darul Ulum in Deoband? That would or, probably yeah. be like the equivalent of like their second year of okay. their full-time okay. program. So you've done Arabic, you've done basic text. Just about, yeah. We've okay. just about finished their Arabic curriculum, uh -huh. which would be like uh, approximately the first two years. Okay. So after having done it for three years part-time, we were almost as if we had finished two years in the full time. So three years, three years part time was equivalent to about two years full time. But we still needed a few touch up texts and a few other additional texts that we were doing when we joined the full time, anyways. But it was right around 
the end of the second year mark right. in a full-time program. And so would the introductory tech, well, it wouldn't be an introductory text, but like you would have done like the Ajitomiya or the equivalent? That's right. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. We did that. the Ajitomiya in, in, uh, yeah. in, our, in our program. Okay. Got it. And then uh, fiqh, theology, uh, maybe logic, grammar. <laughs> Yeah. So yeah, again, so part part of the design. curriculum included yeah. a lot of these topics. I mean, we didn't really get into logic much, but right. definitely it was fiqh, hadith. Uh, you're doing aqidah studies, usul. You're getting okay. into usul al fiqh, right. usul al hadith, translation of the Quran, translation of uh, a hadith. So the Riyadh al Salihin, we're translating the Arba'in of Imam al Nawawi. So these are all. I mean, yeah. the curriculum is like I said, six yeah. years, six seven years long. So there's a lot of texts. But by this point, we're sort of jumping into it. We're already translating the Quran. We translated 20 chapters of the Quran. We're you know when we started the third year, a third year, or maybe early of the fourth year, um, we did the tafsir of the Quran. So we started that, and we had the great honor to do the tafsir with Sheikh Hashim Ahmad, mm. who is another amazing person who you Ooh, know I definitely think, try to yeah. uh, get a hold of for the for the podcast but I would love to and and I thank you for making the introduction because I I, I met him when you brought him to Talif those many years ago just a remarkable soul uh, fascinating individual Omar white Caucasian mm. American background has lived I think in the in the Muslim world in Pakistan for 30 decades, plus 30 years plus yeah year. yeah just a remarkable individual and uh, but anyway yeah so so he was doing the tafsir you said so he, we we had the, the honor to ha have him come and teach us the tafsir of the Quran. Okay. And so we did tafsir with him. Uh, then we did a few of our texts of hadith with him, the Mishkat, Mishkat al Masabi, collection of hadith texts, which traditionally, uh, you know, I learned this from some of our teachers that traditionally in, in, in Afghanistan, a student who reads up to the Mishkat, generally that's when they would conclude. And that would be sort of like the hallmark of their completion is that have you done the mishkat with someone, right? Uh, with someone, right? Mm -hmm. With a formal, with a formal teacher. So we Correct. had that opportunity, and we did that with Sheikh Hashim. It was a great honor, you know. Right. It, was, it was a great honor to have done that. And so the Dars Nizami. The interesting thing is, is that we weren't in one location doing it. Moved from well, when we started the full time program, it was at Irvington Masjid. Okay. Then from there, we kind of had a few different places we would go to, and then ultimately landing us at Masjid Al Huda. Because now this is right around the time Masjid Al Huda gets purchased okay. around 2014. For those not familiar with the Bay Area, it's it's a beautiful uh, church that has been converted into a masjid, into a center, I should say. Beautiful. It still has retained a lot of the uh, stained glass work, and it's just a remarkable structure. And, Absolutely. You know, of course, the community has preserved much of it that it, that they can. I think it's, isn't it a historical landmark? I mean, and there's probably so there's, some limitations. there's so much to be said about yeah. Masjid Al Huda. Okay. If I open up that that uh, that uh, <laughs> envelope of conversation, there's it's. So interesting, but yeah, absolutely. So it's a historic building. Downtown Union City, California. The original those. downtown. The original downtown. Historic Which, building. It is the oldest building in almost all of Fremont and, and Union City. Really? Built around 1862, yeah. the original structure of it. Yeah. Um, and so that building, of course, it's gone through multiple uh, yeah. editions of, it, of itself, but the foundations were placed around 1862. Who would have thought that you know, nearly 161 years ago that a church would be built for Muslims to pray in, <laughs> you know? And yeah, not only that, yeah. but for ulama to be produced out of, right. hafiz of Quran to be produced out of, Alhamdulillah. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll hop in for like a random, like I'm coming home from work and I need to make Asr before I miss it or something. And there's every day, there's HIFS programs that are going on, young students of all ages studying with uh, their teachers. I mean, mashallah. Yeah, it's, it's beautiful. <clears throat> I want to ask a question. Uh, as a parent, it's always top of mind. Uh, I'm just curious, like, what advice would you give in order to kind of nudge youth or put them in a situation maybe where they're inspired the way you were. Is there any secret sauce or is it just, obviously it's a lot of baraka and um, I'm curious. I mean, you had, you talked about the, the halakha, the Hayward halakha. Is there anything else? Uh, I'm sure your parents did an amazing job as well. That's, I'm, I, no, that's I, a I, great I, question. I, you're, that's a you're, good question. You're, you're younger. You're about probably about 10 years, and 10, 12 years younger. And as someone who than, I imagine speaks to young people, yeah. you know, as someone who engages the community in various other capacities, my challenge is being able to connect with young people anymore because I'm not so young. So, I, I mean, one, I mean, I think it's it's great that you're still doing that. And I, I know that, that's, that, that that continues to be a challenge to be able to connect with young people as you're getting older. But yeah, so I, I'd love for you to kind of take on 
both of For that. Sure. Like I, how, how you engage young people and to Omar's point, like how do you inspire young people to, if not study Islam to the extent maybe that you did, but certainly motivate them enough to learn the fara'id, you know, and learn the ma'lum uh, din, like the, the, the basic necessities that they need to know. For sure. And this is such a good question, but also such a hard question. Yeah. I would say in my experience, because I work with young adults mostly, college age or right before college age, that's my the population that I normally work with. The, the biggest challenge is finding that connection for them, that deep personal connection to the faith for them. Because people are by default, a manifestation of their experiences, how they grew up, uh, whatever they saw or experienced. And so people's outlook on life will be very different. Finding the thing to connect that person, giving them hope, giving them that space where they feel heard, they feel valued, they feel like I can come here freely. Um, and then, of course, having qualified people for them to connect to. This is just invaluable. The reality is that the mistake that it, I think often happens is that we send our children to the masajid without there being any infrastructure in place there for them to develop or to get nurtured further, not to take away from the masjid itself. When you say there, you mean infrastructure at the masjid or an in infrastructure in the home to to support what, whatever it, may it be It could happening. be both, both. but, when, but yeah. I think what happens is uh -huh. people just send their kids to the masjid. Yeah, yeah, it's like or outsourced. They, exactly, like yeah. just send them there, they'll take care of it. Um, or send them to Islamic school, that'll take care of it. And they do their part where they can. But at the end of the day, you know, some places just don't have the resources. Sometimes certain masajid don't have scholars that can speak speak to the youth, for example, some places they really do. And even now when we have, you know, conferences in the Bay Area, you find that like you'll have students from so-and-so teacher in Richmond and their students are really developed, really put well put together. Why? Because they had an amazing imam mm. and that imam knew how to connect with them and he was relatable and he knew how to sort of draw them in. And that prophetic terbiya, right, where you are with someone all the time and they can work on them and develop them. Definitely that starts at the home, right? Because you can't expect for your kids to just sort of connect and like really take off um, just by sending them somewhere. So it definitely starts at home. But in my personal experience, it's just having the right people and making those connections for your children, knowing what their strengths are, knowing what their weaknesses are, and playing to that. Especially with a lot of folks who are in college who feel very much isolated, they feel like they can't connect with their parents. Finding the right crowd for them is, is golden. It's golden. And it's it's a difficult thing. And I personally don't think that there's a, a simple solution to this. I guess if I were to summarize everything I just said, it would be finding the right environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's and that's just, just, that's what changed me, mm -hmm. right? And that's what I needed. It was like a good friend who was the person who called me and said, come to the Hayward Halakha. The other thing was also the environment. Because when I got there, it was receptive. It allowed me to come. It allowed me to be there. Mm -hmm. And there's a very funny story I'll just briefly mention that there was a person there during dinner. And I love this brother. And I still see this brother all the time. I've mentioned this story to him and he doesn't remember. I'm incredibly grateful for him. When I was a young 14-year-old, just kind of showing up to these Friday night um, talks, they would have pizza there. And sometimes the pizzas would come with like jalapenos. And I was that little picky kid that wouldn't eat my pizza with the jalapeno. So I would pick them out. And I remember I got the pizza once and I was about to pick out the jalapenos out of it. And this brother, his name is Arshad. I'm going to name drop him. I don't care if he hears or not. So he's a cool guy. He's amazing. Um, he actually was there with his young son and his son started picking out the jalapenos too. So he sort of really yelled at his son and harshly he says, there's people dying in this country that they don't have food to <laughs> eat. And, there's a, and, and he's a hurry. And he took a whole, like a whole, like handful of the jalapenos and he ate the whole thing in one bite. And it just made me laugh. You know, and I was sitting there right across from him on the on the mat and I just was laughing. You know, fast forward 15, 16 years, he's a student at Masjid al Hoda now. It's and that I, young boy who was picking no, the no, the, oh, the sorry, guy Arshad. himself, Arshad. Yeah, yeah, Arshad. So he's yeah. a he's a mashallah <laughs> yeah. uh, an adult, you know, he's I'm an adult too, I guess. But <laughs> so he's he's my elder. So he's there and he's a student, mashallah, he pursuing his education. So I had a chance to tell him the story. And he started laughing. I said, I, the reason why I'm sharing this is because that memory stuck with me. Even if it's irrelevant to my development or my nurturing, yeah. it was a moment that kept me coming to the halakha because it was such a wholesome moment. Yeah. And you were, yes, a little harsh with your son, but you were doing that to teach everybody else a lesson. 
I don't know how we got there, but yeah, uh, yeah. But yeah. yeah. well, we're just talking about the youth and the experiences you have as a right. young person that maybe right. inspire inspire you. I do want to maybe start talking about some of the work you're doing, whether it be with youth or with. Yeah families. So maybe, Perez, you can maybe pivot pivot us there. Well, I mean, I'll, I'll defer to Sheikh Jaber, but I mean, you've maybe bring us to the point where you've completed your Tars and Izami and the equivalent and your this ongoing and your students of knowledge for the rest of our lives. But when that sort of period ends, do you, um, I guess, what gets you into mental health and, and where you are working with Khalil Center and, and Wasila? Yeah, and I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that anybody who pursues scholarship, there's probably a moment where you graduate and you go, okay, or how do I apply this? Oh, yeah, yeah, right? we, which is a conversation we've had. Yeah. I, and I know that was a question that I remember you asked uh, uh, Sheikha Muslim. Like, yeah. you come back from Azhar, it's like, yeah. you know, it's not World like the, is your oyster right. type situation. Like, <laughs> well, how, how do you... Maybe, maybe not. Yeah, how do you, you know, yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, how do you apply it? Like, yeah. how, uh, there's so many things you could do. Right. So, yeah, share with us how, like, how the studies kind of completed, in a sense, and then how you decided to apply those. Yeah. So, so again, I'm not good with the timeline, but I was in undergrad yeah. when, while I was at the same time doing the full-time Ademia yeah. program. And so it just so happened that I then graduated from undergrad and I'm in a master's program now. So I went to a master's program for psychology because I wanted to pursue therapy as a profession. At the same time, I'm still in the Alimia program. It's a lengthy program. Did you have to do the um, year abroad or, or, or continue your studies overseas? So that was what was different. That so that okay. was different yeah. for my particular batch of colleagues and students was that the teachers had decided that we're going to do everything here. And this, I don't believe, had happened until that point. Until yeah. that point mm. where we had a complete khatam of the Bukhari Sharif and the six canonical texts of Hadith. Uh, here in a formal setting. And so we said, we're going to do that. And so that's what we ended up doing. So the other thing that's important to notice is that we didn't actually end in six years. Our journey actually ended up taking a little bit closer to eight years. And that's because I did part-time. Our classes, we ended up doing a year extra with the full-time program. So it was more closer to maybe eight years. And then if you count the fact that I did three years part-time, you add that, it was more like 10 years for me. Wow. So it was a very yeah. long journey, one that I'm incredibly grateful for, but it was not traditional at all. But how did you, you quickly touched on, you wanted it to be, you wanted to go into counseling and therapy. I'm curious, like also how did that happen in parallel? So, you okay, studying, so that didn't happen. Yeah. So that's a different story, but yes, all this is happening at the same time. The education is ongoing. While I'm in undergrad and I'm deciding what to major in, I remember I, I had just a general interest in psychology at the time. But really what pushed me was that I had um, six good friends who just, they got married one year. They all got six, married. Six friends, six, six good friends, friends got married. <laughs> different social networks, <laughs> okay. but I it see. just so happened that they, they all got married yeah. in one, one year. And the very next year, they all got divorced. Oh, wow. In different ways, right? right? In different ways, different reasons, different things happened. But just one after the other, I'm just hearing so-and-so got divorced and so-and-so got divorced. And, and that's really when it pushed me. And I said, there's something here I don't understand. I'd like to learn more about it. That's what essentially pushed me into the MFT cycle or track, marriage family therapy. And so when I was in undergrad, I think this may have been my third year in undergrad when I this thing happened. Yeah. So then I said, okay, now I got to think like this, like yeah. how do I, what's the next step? So all of my third year in undergrad was learning what the next steps are. So by my fourth year graduating school, I graduated undergrad, I applied to grad school, got to grad school, got accepted to grad school, and started that journey for becoming a marriage family therapist. All the while, ongoing uh, Alamia program mm. is, is happening on the side. And that's also full-time, that's ongoing. Any other impetus besides, I mean, of course, very dear friends going through that type of a life experience can certainly, you know, identify at least or have you look into, recognize that there's a real problem in the community community. But beyond that, I mean, I think one, especially as children of immigrants, being a product of immigrant communities, mental health issues and, and talking about that even is there's a the stigma associated with seeking mental health, you know, assistance. So is that also kind of in the in the back? Definitely. Of your mind? I yeah. mean, that was yeah. there. I You're think almost, well. I think that must have been sort of the precursor to everything. I think right. the whole idea for me to explore psychology was all of that, just like what it was like for people, the immigrant population that I grew up with, um, friends, family, uncles, relatives, just to see kind of how it affected them. How come there isn't real discussion about this in yeah. these communities? Right. The discussion exists outside, doesn't exist inside, or at right. least it didn't around me. 
And right. so I didn't even see that. So that led that journey on and I go to grad school for that and it's continuing in that whole process. And, you know, you mentioned upon, you know, completion of the study. So we'll fast forward a bit here. The journey to complete grad school also took very long for me. And it wasn't your traditional two to three year grad school program. For me, it ended up taking six years. And that was also here in the Bay Area? That was in Berkeley at okay. a private university called Wiser. And I actually have to thank uh, honorable mention Sheikh Rami for this. Sheikh Rami actually, you know, I'd shared with him, I really want to do grad school. And I had explored various grad schools and thinking which school I want to go to. And I just realized, you know, I just can't afford any of these. Yeah. So I think this is where my journey stops because mm. I just can't afford them. I have a small family business in Union City. It's a Islamic clothing store. And is, is that still open, by the way? It is still open. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. Been, real quick. The, 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 bull clothing. Yeah, clothing. Yeah, right, thank exactly. you. So that's right. So we have a... Uh, when, when we were talking about downtown Union City, I wanted to bring it up, but... Sure, yeah. So, so thank you for bringing it up, though. I, I was there. I worked at the store and, you know, I, I, I opened up that business in college, as a matter of fact. Really? I was in college. Yeah, it was Michelle summer not. of 2012. And I said, uh, you know, I really want to do something. I came back the next fall, the next uh, quarter, and I said, I'm going to do this. And so I set out with uh, my father and... We went and we opened up this business, but I, I gotta um, say I love the uh, proactive jump right in spirit. Yeah, well, you know that's kind of the story of my life because everything <laughs> that I, I had this fear, honestly, personally, that I never wanted to look back on my life and say I could have done that. Regrets, especially yeah. knowing that I could have actually mm -hmm. done it, mm -hmm. and that that's what drives me even to this day. Actually, you know, I'm working at the store one day and I had essentially given up in my heart. I had given up. I said I'm not going to be able to. And subhanAllah, Sheikh Rami just walked into the store because his uh, organization, Taiba Foundation, was just down the street. And they're still there to this day. Uh, they're down the street from uh, Masjid Al-Huda. That's right, yeah. So I didn't know they had a brick and mortar. So for those who, who, who may not be familiar, Sheikh Rami Ansur is the one who we're talking about. He walks into the store and gives me a, a packet, like an actual packet of researched grad schools that he's done i don't know why or where or how he came up with this but he just gives me this packet and he goes here jabber this is for you i want you to look at this and if you're interested in any type of therapy here are some universities that offer these programs and I, it was a, a literal godsend because as i looked on there he showed me one that was incredibly affordable it was self-paced and remote you essentially stay in communications with your professors via email phone call video chat so a couple days later he had a meeting with one of the the, the president of the school so i came i met with him etc and we, we got that process started so that was actually how that journey began for me to go into grad school. And it happened because of Sheikh Rami's influence and all this sort of stuff. But it ended up taking six years for me to complete grad school. And the reason for that is because during that period of time, I ended up getting married, I ended up having children and moving from apartment and going through, mm -hmm. you know, all this sort of stages of life that a person does when you get married and you have a kid and you move out and all these sort of things. That sort of delayed my grad school time. But it just so happens, subhanAllah, that ultimately when I completed my grad school education in 2020, I also a few months later completed and had our graduation for the Alamiya program. Mm -hmm. And it just happened within a few months of each other. So one was a 10-year Alamiya program. The other was a six-year grad school program. So the one thing I would say is that for a lot of people who think this is a very quick journey, Right? You, you know, you go in and you do these things. I mean, you see the after effect. Okay, you see someone speaking somewhere. You see yeah. someone invited to be a guest speaker. But it wasn't cookie cutter for me at all. It wasn't what I was thinking going mm. into it. That it'd be like a simple, not even simple, but a six-year course. You, you go in, you go out, you're mm. done. It was much longer than that. There was so many twists and turns on that, on that road. So, you know, how this all connects again is that grad graduated from grad school, graduated from madrasa. And, you know, I say graduated because that was the ceremony of it, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. definitely it's an ongoing journey and right. continuing to study and stay with your teachers, staying connected to your teachers. I attribute, you know, after the, you know, tawfiq from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the duas of my parents, I, I attribute all of my successes to my teachers and their duas and, yeah. and their guidance, because yeah. without that, I think I'd be totally misguided and lost. But, so like you said, I mean, you know, you identified trends in the community where mental health issues go unaddressed and we just don't engage that part of it. I think a lot of that has changed. So I guess start talking about now 
what you do once you graduate. Um, were there already some institutions that you could plug right into? I mean, we, we've mentioned Khalil Center. That's yeah. one I'm sure many are familiar with. So that's where I was during my grad sure. school time. So I had spent about approximately five years with Khalil Center. Um, they had their offices uh, in the South Bay uh, at the MCA Masjid yeah. originally. So talk, do you, if you have knowledge, maybe share about the kind of genesis of Khalil Center, if you know a little bit about yeah, their background. So I know uh, Chicago slash Bay Area connection. That's all. So it yeah. originally started based out of Chicago with their founder, Human Keshavarzi, who uh, was really into uh, the concept of the overlap between uh, you know Islam and the idea that Islam provides this resource in its rich history for mental health concerns. And so he established the organization, started working on this idea of how we can find Islamic psychology and how we can create that sort of connection, how we can establish that bridging the gap between modern psychological practice and the traditional sciences. And so that was his project. And that's what he established. And of course, there was a lot of iterations of it and it developed, et cetera, et cetera. But ultimately, it made its way over to the Bay Area. I met him, actually, Brother Human, at a there was a program in, in Chicago at uh, Dottle Hikma, which was one of the organizations that at the time it's no longer uh, functioning, but it yeah. existed at the time. And right. there was an event there and I had met him there and we were talking about Islamic psychology. I was in grad school at the time and he had already established his organization. So funny enough, that's where we originally met, but we didn't meet again formally until a few years later. So ultimately they opened up a satellite location at the MCA uh, masjid in one of their buildings and that ran it was operational for a few years until we were able to establish a home base or like a headquarters in union city also down the street from masjid al huda so that was a very large office and mashallah we had uh I think nearly 12, 13 clinicians there. It was a very functional team. Was Dr. Rania always involved with... with so she was the, the clinical director okay. for the Bay Area chapter. Right. That's right. So she was the clinical director for the Bay Area chapter. Yeah. So we all worked together. It was a great cohort of um, some amazing clinicians, mashallah. And right around COVID is when, you know, there were some structural changes within the organization. And so they had to close the office down. It was right around that time I transitioned over to Wasila. Okay. So, Wasila transitioned as in you. This is something you founded yourself, correct? No, no. Right? So, I did not found uh, find Wasila. As okay. a, as a matter of fact, the the director, the, the founder and director, her name is Sana Subhani, and she's also a licensed clinical social worker. Okay. And so, this was her organization, but I transitioned to that ah, organization okay. as uh, a clinician there and okay. religious director. So that was right, sort of at the tail end when Khalil Center sort of decided to close their offices there. I'm fascinated because rewind back to I don't want to say five, but certainly seven to ten years ago, and mental health counseling therapy was not on the minds of the average Muslim. For sure. I mean, it's this is a societal trend as well. But I'd love to hear from you. Like, do you think we've made? progress. I, I feel like anecdotally talking to younger people, it is top of mind. They're aware they get they do proactively get help when they need it. Again, very anecdotally. I'm, I'd love to hear what you're Absolutely. saying. Absolutely. I would I would agree. I would totally agree. I would say yeah. that it's I think society, the societal trend had a lot to do with it mm -hmm. yeah. because it, it made it a, a global phenomenon and it For made sure. it something that was on. It certainly is global because, I mean, I think boomers generally ignored it. I mean, Gen X, I think, have gotten, uh, are a little better about it. Uh -huh. And I think it's really Gen X Only coming later. of age. Only later. Exactly. Yeah. I'm saying hitting their middle ages, yeah. Gen X, where I mean, you I, begin to see. I don't think either of us got merit, premarital counseling no, or anything no, like no, that. Absolutely. Right? So, but I think the subsequent generation is very different. Talking about mental health, check one's mental health status mm. all of that is part of the culture yeah yeah do you think do you think like it's the majority yet yeah. or not quite there like for example pick, taking a an example do you think the vast majority do you think the majority of muslim couples before they get married are getting counseling or still not there yet what i'll say to that is i think it's getting better i i can't say that the vast majority are and I, I think that'd be a bit of a stretch to assume that they would, but I would certainly say the numbers are getting better. Why? Because of more awareness, more, especially within the masajid, like the scholarship, the board, the community, they're more open to the idea of running programs, yeah. um, having therapists come out, offering services through their masjid, having marriage seminars, premarital workshops, having consultation services for students, for the people in the community. These are valuable opportunities for people to have because yeah. you might think, okay, well, everyone 
everyone knows about mental health. Well, the reality is a lot of people don't That's realize right. it as like a as something to to check in on if mm-hmm. there's something going on, right? So people will naturally turn to their imams, their scholars and say, hey, Sheikh, there's something going on. I don't know what's up. They might not know all the lingo and the terminology or like, you know, the offices, etc. But they'll turn to their imams and their masajid. So seeing that more of these resources are, be, are are available. And I think what's, you know, again, I'm ent- entirely grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for granting me this opportunity to be able to wear two different kufis, <laughs> right? Um, to, to be the, yeah. the therapist and, to, and then to be in this religious space because of the fact that now, you know, we're actually here in the Bay Area, we have a religious body known as the Islamic Sharia Council of California. And Every generally speaking, most metropolitan cities have their own body of scholars. But here in the Bay Area in Northern California, this is the body that we have, and we meet quarterly. And there's over 150 ulama on this board of scholars that you know people can send their questions in. They meet regularly in person. Our last meeting was literally Sunday at Masjid uh, Ibrahim Khalilullah Masjid in Fremont, and we go over cases, divorce cases, uh, you know, inheritance cases, land disputes, and all these sort of the key like questions. Like gray, gray area cases. It, it, it could well, be really anything yeah, that you have even. a major dispute that you'd okay, like a body okay. of scholars to okay. review. Okay. Uh, <laughs> things as simple as, Sheikh, I don't know the terms of this contract yeah, that I have. It's an Islamic contract, but I, I'm not sure. Could you review it? All the way to, I think our masjid board is, I don't know, uh, stealing money. Right. And how do we address that? A very complicated, complex issues. So we have this body of scholars. And what's very interesting is, is that being a part of that now fraternity, you see matters that come up that are mental health related and you find that there's such a good synergy between scholars knowing to refer to mm-hmm. those people who are better qualified to handle mental health issues yeah. versus purely religious issues very very and important. the fact that that's happening more so again just to answer your question Omar like mm-hmm. I can't say that the majority of you know discussions mm-hmm. are about mental health and people are aware of it even in their marriages or in other categories right. but what I can say is that it's definitely getting better because yeah. there is the connection between scholars and therapists um, more people are aware of the subject and less people are thinking that this is some quackery that mm-hmm. some folks have come up with that somehow challenges the ulama it, but rather there, there's a synergy yeah, yeah. yeah that's is, is key. it is it um do you think it's a supply side bottleneck problem right now or more on the demand side so meaning what i mean is like the demand is there but do we have enough professionals to meet that demand or is it we still need to kind of build that build the idea in the community that's another excellent question that's great question. and i'll also share this because i'm also part of the fraternity of muslim you know counselors and counselors in general always room to grow there are so many organizations that have a wait list that they need more. And I'm biased here, but but I'm going to say it through my bias that we need more Muslim practicing clinicians, mm-hmm. obviously, obvious Muslims, you know, identifying Muslims that are practicing and that yeah. they are uh, in this field. Because there are people need to understand that it's not just about your religious affiliation, but it's the practice. Right. Th- if this is what you believe, but that's not what you practice, you're not available to the person who practices this and not just believes it. And that's a little bit different. Because if you believe something, if you believe a religious, I am Muslim, but I don't live that life, then your therapy experience will be very different than a person who says, I'm Muslim and I live it because you no longer have that shared experience. And so I would say that within the Muslim community, definitely there, the demand is there for it. Meaning we okay. need more people in this field who can sort of uh, balance both sides, the religious side and the, and the yeah. therapy side. Your point, I mean, I think there's a supply side issue, but at yeah. the same time, you know, creating awareness in the community where one, we have resources that people can go to when they have mental health issues that need to be addressed. And then also the fact that, you know, removing the stigma, dissociating the stigma associated with those type of things where seeking counseling, going to a therapist is shunned or, sh- you know, looked down upon, or there's, like you said, quackery. Or I'll even add to that yeah. a very interesting discovery uh-huh. I made um, not too long ago, which was, you know, in Afghanistan, it's, it's you know, when you're, when, you're, when you're talking to elders, when you're talking to people who are older than you, and we, we say rish safed, we, meaning a, a white beard, right? A, a sign of an elder. Certain terminology, traditionally, you say anything about you need mental health support, you know, you need to see a therapist, it's an immediate shutdown, right? Of You're course. not going to get any engagement from that 
community, from right. that population. And I found that this was really hard because I had a lot of clients who struggled with some of the elders in their family mm -hmm. or the elders in their family were was the problem and they just didn't know how to address it. They didn't know how to bring it up without the other person getting offended or shutting down the conversation. So I realized, you know, working with a lot of elders and some of my work with the city of Fremont is actually work with aging. I work with the aging population 55 and older. And so I was just realizing just the culture was different. The attitudes were different, etc. And I think I had an aha moment where I was sitting with a a few other Afghan therapists, and we were discussing words that are, you know, therapeutic words that are translated into Farsi. And she said, I'm having, you know, this this, this uh, young uh, clinician that I was uh, working with, she said, I'm having a hard time connecting with the elders. And I said, that's funny you say that. I have been too having a hard time because I'm thinking, how can we get our elders? Because that's a huge part of the population we need to reach out to because they're the elders, yeah. because they're the shot callers largely. And so if you can't reach them, you know, you're, you're, you're going to make very minor progress here. That's a good point. Minimal progress. So, you know, we were sort of contemplating on this. And, and then I said, you know, I, I feel like I need to make mashwara on this. And for whatever reason, in my mind, mashwara, of course, uh, being consultation, right. translated consultation, in my mind, for some reason, I interpreted that as when I said consultation, I said that out loud. I said consultation. Consultation is like a consultation service, like a session, almost like therapy. And for some reason, it just c clicked right then and there that instead of saying therapy, instead of using medical terminology, mm. say mashwara. Use vernacular that resonates. Mm. Absolutely. Use yeah. the words that would make sense to him. Yeah. And so when I started changing that, I said, I'm going to do this right now. Mm. So I called my grandfather and mm -hmm. I'll not preserve him. He's in his 80s. I mean. And I called him and I just said, uh, you know, I just told him, I said, you know, I just want to make uh, mashwara with you about a, a few things and let's make mashwara about this some point. And it was a completely made up story right. but i just like you know and he went he gave me almost an hour of his time and we he was discussing his issues and some of his experiences and challenges but here's the thing like that moment wouldn't have happened like that otherwise right and i felt like that sort of unlocked for me a great deal of access to an under i don't want to say underprivileged but a, right. but a community uh, that i wouldn't otherwise have access to right 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 uh, under engaged very 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 true. i want to ask a, a kind of a, a another question related to the trend mm. so um we live in a time of social media and influencers uh, where what's what are your thoughts on kind of the intersection or the difference between influencers coaches and counselors and therapists. This like is a dialogue that. amongst counselors that um, is had <laughs> like that. quite a bit. Yeah. Um, I think therapists, licensed therapists have a bit of a problem with coaches sometimes because of the lack of uh, responsibility when it comes to their license on the line. Coaches don't have that same degree of responsibility. Yeah. And, and I know that coaches will disagree and they'll say, no, it's like the same thing. But we're limited. The BBS can take away your, the, the Board of Behavioral Sciences can take away your license. And the rules are not as strict for coaches. It's a lot more flexible. And I think that the difference is, and again, I'll just speak to it based on my experience, and I'm sure people will disagree with me, and I'm sure people will have their own thoughts on this, but I think that when you have someone who's held accountable, let's say from an Islamic point of view, because of their sanad, when we graduate from an Islamic institution, you're afforded a sanad, a certificate that connects you to your teachers, that connect you to their teachers, all the way up to the Prophet Ali Salatu Wasalam, and so that sanad is very, very important. Your teachers can revoke your sanad if they find that your practice post-graduation is no longer in line with the tradition, according to their understanding. And therefore, it's considered a great, great shame if a person were to lose their sanad in terms of your teachers revoking it. That being said, I think that's what help keeps a lot of people accountable and keeps right. them responsible. The same can be said, I think, when it comes to, uh, in terms of your clinical experience and your cl clinical practice, knowing that I have to be on guard and be very considerate and be very aware of what I do, how I do, how I engage, how I function, what I provide as resources for my clients, knowing that there is going to be this governing body that could potentially take that away from me, offers and affords you a different degree of seriousness that I think I, I don't believe is the same for coaches. There's accountability. Yeah. yeah, to a degree higher. Mm -hmm. And I think that would be my uh, my only take that's on a, this. It's a really good, yeah, that's a, that's a really good way to look at it. But you're right. I mean, you know, with social media, I think, and the ubiquity of people out there who are either influencers or coaches to, to be able to identify 
you know, people who are actually legitimate and worthy of engagement versus just who's yeah. a who's the quack, right? <laughs> to, to, and, borrow, to borrow an expression. Yeah. And maybe just the last, maybe yeah. my last question on the topic of um, kind of mental health counseling. I know when we were just having um, dinner, you were talking about how Muslim counselors bring spiritual health into the mix. Do you want to touch on that real quick? Yeah, yeah. Good. Yeah, I mean, the it's a relatively newer concept, I think, for the mental health world, but the idea of Islamically integrated psychotherapy. So going back now to Khalil Center to mention, and, you know, I'm very excited to know that there's an entire field emerging of Islamic psychology where you could be a clinician, a therapist, but be certified in another modality of practice like you would normally with you know, various modalities. I'm, I'm a CBT trained cognitive behavioral therapist. I'm a emotion focused th uh, therapist. Now you can be a TIIP certified therapist, which is, you know, a Gottman, th you go through the Gottman program, John Gottman's program on mental health. So you go to series one, two, and three, and then you're certified in all three levels. It's like a big deal yeah. amongst clinicians. Now you can add this to that, to your list of accomplishments and accolades is that I am also TIIP certified, which and is, that's yeah. traditionally integrated Islamic psychotherapy, which is a very particular modality that the Khalil Center offers to their clinicians. Three stages to it, three levels to it. And upon completion of the third level, you get the full, you get to be put on a directory um, a na nationwide or even international directory of uh, the only TIIP certified clinicians in the world. It's a fantastic concept. And I don't want to speak to so the origin story of why Khalil Center developed this, et cetera. But what I will say is no, very God interesting. Willing, I mean, I, and I really appreciate you name dropping it and, and, and specifically mentioning Dr. Homan because, you know, inshallah, God willing, I mean, we will have him on the show. In fact, it's slated for uh, July. So you're almost sort of teasing the listening audience in terms of uh, a deeper dive into TIIP and other affiliated sort of modalities. Definitely. It's, it's yeah. certainly something to be excited about. Good. And yeah. that's the thing. I think it, it's something... To, to give kind of a, a, a simpler example, it's kind of like the idea of traditionally with uh, within Sufic lodges, the person who is the person who has a disease of the heart would go to his scholar, go to his sheikh, go to his teacher, yeah. and he would prescribe for him a prescription. You know, I yeah. want you to make X amount of dhikr per day, per week, then come back in a week and then we'll reassess. Certain people, for example, their temperament is that they're a very uh, nat naturally hot tempered person, which would mean that they naturally are agitated. Yeah. So then, you know, we know from traditional hikmah, which is like being a hakim, uh, traditional medicine that, you know, doctors would prescribe different types of things for you, you know, go out and breathe the fudger air for an hour, go on a hike and, and breathe the fudger air for an hour. Mm, yeah. uh, this is cooling for one's body. One of, uh, one of the amongst the greatest scholars of the subcontinent, Maulana um, Ashraf Ali Tanwi, Rahimahullah, one of his prescriptions was that he would, he would, sorry, one of his own practices was that after Fajr, he would go for a walk and he wouldn't allow anybody to walk with him. And that's his time yeah. that he needs to clear his mind and to keep his mind clear of all other thoughts and worries and griefs and just focus on himself. So the idea is, is that this now modality coming about seeks to provide this type of healing from a spiritual lens. And, you know, there was this fascinating statistic that showed some great percentage of Americans wanted that their clinician engage in a spiritual activity with them, some form of prayer or some form of, you know, remembrance of God, meaning that they were still attached to the concept of God, even in medical practice. And keeping that in mind, as Muslims, probably even more so. So not just meditation or mindfulness, you're actual saying an actual, God. Wow, like actual God, actual spirituality, yeah, yeah. a religious practice. Mm, um, fascinating. And so, you know, if you keep that in mind and then you realize, okay, so that's something that, you know, Americans are still talking about as Muslims, then even more so probably, mm -hmm. right? That we would want our spirituality. We would want to, you know, the biggest challenge has been that Muslims go to non-Muslim therapists and you're finding a, a clash of culture, a clash of, you know, a, a really of understanding of your religion. And it's become very difficult for Muslims to go to therapists. As a matter of fact, when I was offering consultation services to the Muslim students at UC Berkeley, one of the biggest challenges that... Uh, uh, we had was that I have received so many complaints from students saying that I go to the therapy services on campus, but because I have anxiety about missing prayer, 
And where am I going to make wudu to make my prayer on campus? I went to the therapist because my anxiety was so elevated. The therapist told me, well, listen, if this is the, if the cause of your anxiety is the prayer, just leave it out for a week, doctor's orders. So the students, <laughs> right. you know, she's just overwhelmed. So she's okay, doctor's orders. She doesn't pray for a week. She comes back the next week, much worse than she was the week before, thinking my anxiety didn't go down. It got way worse. I haven't prayed for a week. And now, you know, my, not only was my anxiety bad about you know, where to make wudu to pray. And now I haven't even prayed for a whole week. So now my anxiety is, you know, through the roof. Right. Wow. That's just one example of yeah. thousands, mm. right? Where having a Muslim clinician provides that resource for you, uh, where you don't need to go into a half hour trailer of what you're talking about. Yeah. You just say, Ramazan's coming. Oh, got it. I know exactly what's on your mind. I know what you're worried about. I totally get it. Yeah, so, you know, Again, this is another one, one of those tangents that yeah, I think no, I, no, I appreciate it. But, um, all. Yeah, yeah, it's it's definitely. I mean, I, the question was really about bringing a spiritual component and yeah. getting into the yeah. into the solution. Definitely appreciate you sharing um, some of your thoughts on kind of the state of yeah. a Muslim mental health and some of the progress we've made. And I think hearing those anecdotes from a clinician has also been really, really insightful. So yeah. I really appreciate that, job. Yeah. yeah. And real quick, just to close yeah. on that, like premarital counseling is one topic. I'm guessing there's things like family issues, maybe addiction. There's a bunch. I mean, what, what, if, you, if you allocate time to discuss mental health issues, I mean, it's, it's pretty much everything. Mm. It's yeah. everything that we do that we've done sort of unrefined. And I hate to make everything about mental health as it seems like the whole world is doing, you know, everything a mental health crisis. But if you think about it more from the from our tradition, from our spiritual tradition, our Islamic tradition, you find that the Prophet والسلام, spoke about ihsan and everything, meaning that being morally perfect or perfect in, in one's actions, in one's abilities, in whatever you do, your work, your interactions with others, this is actually our faith. So, for example, if we're struggling because we're depressed and we're able, unable to function properly, etc., our faith teaches us that we should be the best at whatever it is that we do. So, if that's the case, if we're suffering, if we're going through depression, we need to identify what's causing that. We need to look at what's making us depressed and what's keeping us down so that we can isolate that, correct that, and learn to move on and to learn to progress. Great tragedy, tragedies occurred in the life of the Prophet ﷺ himself, and yet, he continued to remain the commander in chief and the leader of the community and father and a husband. And actually, now it sort of it reminds me part of the origin story of Khalil Center was the story of the great scholar Maulana Khalil Ahmed Saranpuri, who he was a great sheikh, uh, sheikh al Hadith, and a great scholar, and a murabbi, and a sheikh of uh, spirituality. And the story goes that his children, he outlived his children, and that they all passed away before his eyes. And due to sickness or various reasons. And throughout all of that, he still remained the Sheikh al-Hadith, scholar of Hadith, the Sheikh of the community, the yeah. spiritual master, the spiritual leader. And in that, there's great resilience yeah. exemplified. And I think the, so the name of the organization, Khalil Center, is actually named after him, Maulana Khalil Ahmad Saranpuri. I didn't know that. So again, just to kind of make yeah. that connection here that I hate to add the mental health topic, you know, title to everything, but the idea is as Muslims, our default position is do ihsan and perfection and everything. So right. whenever you find that there's a deficiency in something, whether it's our emotional state, our character, the way we are, our acting, all that, uh, it's important to understand that we have to bring that back to perfection or as close to perfection as possible. Yeah. No, I think it's a great point. I think, and I'd, I'd, I'd to hear your thoughts about this as well, which is there's also, I think, a great deal of emphasis in our tradition on akhlaq, right? On on and 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 now, you know, there's so much talk about social agility, EQ, emotional intelligence, emotional quotient, so you know, et cetera. To me, that those are all manifestations of akhlaq. I mean, and and I, you know, I, yeah. I don't want to make this like the like no, just the whole conversation, but right. the one thing I'll add to that is just sure. a, another anecdote is when I was an undergrad. And I was sitting in one of my classes. I remember I had a notebook. And this notebook, at that time, I was really overly zealous about my spiritual connection with and my spiritual relationship and my getting into my dean again and being very active. So I remember the professor would be speaking about various concepts in psychology and I'd be writing in my notebook, he's a thief. He stole this from our Islamic tradition. <laughs> and these are all Islamic concepts of yeah. spirituality and tasawwuf right. and tazkiyah and purification. And But absolutely, yeah. akhlaq, right? Behavior modification. That's right. That's, that's the psychology word for it. And as my grad school professor used to say, that's the monkey talk for it. You know, the, the, the monkey talk is all the fancy psychology 
psychology terminology for these things that we all know already. That's Behavior right. modification is reformation of character, tazkiyat to nafs, you know, islahi akhlaq. So, That's but cool. yeah. Well, def I'm definitely plus one on uh, akhlaq and ihsan, uh, just being like major, major catch-all remedies, right? Um, catch-all remedies. And like silver and, bullets, if you will. And at the very least, I mean, you know, in terms of, you know, going back to the idea of what we can do as parents, I mean, right? I mean, yeah. you know, spirit, like religious training aside, I mean, I think the the home becomes the, the repository where, or the uh, the incubator where, you know, akhlaq is disseminated and taught. Yeah. I mean, you know, we, we, all of us... Uh, have our own various degrees in terms of our own knowledge yeah. of the tradition, as it were. But yeah. so we may or may not be able to impart those to our children. But teaching etiquette and teaching comportment, which is what a clock is, yeah. behavioral modification, to use a clinical term, that's what our duty, you know, yeah. that, that's our job as yeah, parents. Yeah, so, absolutely. And, so and, the, and just on like, yeah. I always think to myself, it's it's teaching it, but then as you get older, oh, living also it. Li living <laughs> it. Because as you get older, you get these opportunities to actually have to that's right. put, put these things into practice for yourself. But no, thanks so much for having this discussion about mental health and, yeah. and, and therapy and so forth. I want to, I do want to, as we get closer to wrapping, there's there's something I actually want to talk about. You've talked about your endeavors in Makubu clothing and business entrepreneurship, being a part of a couple of different foundations like the Khalil Center and Osila. I also want to talk about Hafsa. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I know that's a passion project of yours uh, that you've been a big part of. That's for, for our listeners who uh, may have heard of Hafsa. It's the Halal Food Standards Alliance of America, if I got it right, Hafsa. Very good. Um, those of you who are in the Bay Area and other large cities in America, you've seen a major trend towards halal, uh, halal food. Or a lot. Well, I mean, I think people are familiar with Hafsa certification. Yeah. It's become sort of the gold standard, uh, I will say. I mean, when I had reached out to you, you know, where you sort of hit my radar, in addition to just sort of meeting each other socially uh, in the community, was your work with Hafsa. So very much something I... To definitely do want to talk about yeah um not only well you've got one foodie and you've got another person well both of us are foodies slash maybe health nuts so i think hafsa and the conversation around food will certainly be uh appropriate for both yeah. of us so yeah if you could talk about not only your involvement but maybe a little bit of a um for those who may not be familiar with a little bit about what uh, how what, hafsa certification began and where that began yeah i'm always interested what was that light bulb moment yeah 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 so absolutely these are you know all of the things that I'm very much, very extremely passionate about. Right. So Hafsa is actually uh, an organization that was established by scholars. And subhanAllah, actually, those scholars ended up being my teachers in my Islamic journey. Does it have a Bay Area origin? I like to uh, think it does. It, it, it does, actually. So the okay. founder of the organization is Mufti Abdullah Nana, who I many people so. know, uh, a local Marin. Marin County, that's yeah. right. So he's in Marin and uh, Mill Valley in particular. And so he got back from his Islamic education in South Africa. And in South Africa, there's a certification body by the name of Sanha. And Sanha is actually the, the certifier in South Africa. And they're all over the place to the extent to where most places you eat at, you know, they have the Sanha certificate and they're, uh, and it makes life easier for Muslims living there to know that, okay, everything's checks out, everything's slaughtered correctly. The name of Allah is taken on the animals. There's no cross contamination. I'm assuming that's another acronym like Sharia. Uh, yeah, oh, yeah. And I okay. actually don't know what it is. No, no, but, I'm not putting you on the spot, but, but it is. Yeah. So it's, yeah. A, it's an acronym. So when, uh, Sheikh Abdullah got back and he was here in the Bay Area. He realized that this is also um, actually a common thing. This is a yeah. this is a bit of a problem here in America where we have no sort of differentiation between products that are hand slaughtered by a Muslim and, you know, tasmiya or the name of Allah is being taken upon versus products that are perhaps mechanically slaughtered or slaughtered by someone other than a Muslim, but both have the same halal labels on them. Hmm. And for people who... I think I give this analogy often, but if you were to go back home somewhere to whatever country of origin and you go to like the village, go to the just the most furthest outskirts of, of the of the town of the village and find a farmer, find a, a local person and ask him to ask him to make a, a sacrifice for you as as the guest. What what is that person who's on the edge of the earth? How is he going to what is he going to do for you for that for you to uh, prepare that meal for you? He's going to take one of his sheep or you know his goat from his flock. He's going to bring it. He's going to lay the animal down, and he'll do what we all think he's going to do: is take a knife, cut at the throat, and say Bismillah, Allahu Akbar. Skin, clean up the animal, and prepare it for you. That same 
herder or farmer or you know whoever if he had a little you know and traditionally they had these little mud homes and mud right. brick homes out in the out in the uh, outskirts if an animal of, of his were to climb on top of these little houses these little mud buildings which often they do actually these animals they kind of find their way to the top and they're yeah. hanging out on top of the houses and if one of them were to fall and break its neck and just and and, and sort of die out on the right in front he just fell and he just died out what would that same farmer do if that animal dies there, he'll say this is murdar, right? He'll say this animal has died in a way which is no longer fit for Muslim consumption. And usually what they'll do is either bury it or they'll burn it or they'll do something to get rid of it, but they will not consume it. This happens all over the world, right? Amongst Muslims. Fast forward to the Western world, globalization, mass production, mass production, the expanding um, demand for products, specialty cuts, various types of, you know, I need, you know, this farm raised Amish chicken and I need this, um, <laughs> yeah. you know, type of, you know, whatever. So, you know, I need my Wagyu beef and I needed this. I mean, I need my olive Wagyu and I need my this Wagyu and grade this, that. So what happens is, is the slaughter practice gets real loose, and yeah. as a result, the traditional definition of what one would think when they say this product is halal can now mean many things. Really? Fascinating. And, and so that's the origin story, the foundation of Hafsa, the organization. Right. So Sheikh Abdullah found that this was a, a concern for him. This is something that he himself was concerned about. He got together with another local scholar, Sheikh Hamza Makbul, um, based out of Chicago. And they sort of founded this organization with a few other very sincere brothers. This was right around 2007, 2008. I jo joined the organization a year later, hmm. around 2009. Fascinating. Pretty and early. Pretty early. R r pretty early. That's right. And they actually... The, the, and I didn't know Hamza Makbul was part of this. Okay. I had no idea. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah, That's yeah, funny. yeah. So, and interestingly, what happened, there was a yeah. conference that was held in the Mill Valley Masjid. It was an open uh, invitation to anybody who was interested. I met Sheikh Hamza Makbul for the first time there. I had known Mufti Abdullah Nana, so... That was my real sort of introduction to what is this all about. And as a result of that, then, of course, I continued to stay, uh, you know, interested in the organization. And even before that meeting, how I even knew that this was a concern, very interestingly, was at Masjid Muhajirin, part of the Hayward Halakha, you know, kind of tying everything together. Mufti Full Abdullah circle. was one of the guest speakers, and he did a series on the conquest of Persia okay. based on the text from... The Sword of Allah, Khalid ibn Walid by General A.I. Akram, which is a fascinating read. If you've never read before, if you haven't seen this book, this is an absolutely beautiful book. So he was doing a series on that. And after everybody left, the Hayward Halakha, you know, it's late at night. Myself and a dear friend of mine would just ask, the sheikh a bunch of questions like normally you know young people do they just right. kill the, the shiuch and bore them bombard them with all their questions <laughs> usually questions that don't make any sense and they're ridiculous <laughs> so that's what we did and then that slowly started turning into him talking about this organization and just like i did with sheikh tamim where i just started going where he was nice. i did the same thing with sheikh abdullah and i started going where he was yeah. and everything to do with halal food just fascinated me mm. because again it was primarily this idea that, hey, I, myself, Jabber, also don't want to eat something that was shot in the head or something where there's no Muslim in the facility and I'm eating this product labeled halal. Then what's the difference between me eating that and McDonald's and yeah. you know anything else for that matter? So that's kind of the origin stories of that. And that progressed and developed and turned into a you know me learning about the certification process which is a service that Hafsa provides and just to briefly go over that part of what the organization does is these weekly audits and there are trained inspectors in each locality in each area so I'm the uh, director of the west coast my role with Hafsa is director of the West Coast operations, so that includes Washington State, Oregon, and California. Um, so we have chapters in San Diego, uh, we're developing chapters in San Diego. We have a chapter in Los Angeles, Bay Area, Sacramento, uh, Seattle. And so it's definitely growing. The demand is growing. And the certification essentially entails that we are not stating whether or not you are halal or haram. We are stating that Hafsa as an organization has its standard. Whatever we believe is standard for halal consumption based on our definitions uh, consulted with scholarship that's what we offer as a service to the community 
And so what we do is we offer the certification where we will vet for the business, for the establishment, their ingredients, their proteins, you know, whether it's a restaurant or a meat market or a manufacturer or a processor, we will vet the entire process to ensure that there's sort of no cross-contamination, that there's no ingredients that are impermissible for halal consumption. And oftentimes these are things that require a very, very acute uh, knowledge base. And that's why our executive director actually is a food scientist. And so he has that ability to be able to determine what are these, you know, we can't even read the ingredients on the back of a bag of chips, right? So you need someone who can. (laughs) It's and, made in a laboratory for, absolutely. You, know, you know, and uh, which, which I, begs the question for me, at least, is I, I would imagine then there's an equal, perhaps not equal, but you're certainly attentive of the fact that, you know, the Quranic guidelines, the traditional guidelines around what we eat and consume is not only halal, but tayyiban. Right, Absolutely. that the food must be pure, if you will, as a translation. So, uh, if you could maybe talk about that, because it's not just because I think people. I mean, as someone who's a product of the '80s and '90s and came of age in that era, where you know everything was around one sheikh would put it. You know, all the all, all the like when the, the shuyukh used to get bombarded with questions at conferences, it was all around halal and hilal. You know, those were the two sort of obsessions. And but no, but I think I think I think uh, even around you know. Um, questions around consumption revolve generally around permissibility. Is it the biha? Is it, you know, is it slaughtered in a certain way? Not so much a focus on the fayyab aspect of the food. Yeah. And and I think I, the, what I would say to that is that yeah. I think that's definitely a even higher standard than, there than just the halal permissibility aspect. And I think that that's something we should strive toward, right. but also being a bit of a I guess a realist, realist in a way. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. The challenge is, is that we need to hit halal. We need wow. to get on the halal standard before anything else. And and I don't say this, sorry, I, I shouldn't put it that way. Yeah. I should rather say, I think we struggle with getting to the halal standard to where the concept of promoting a tayyib product or a tayyib concept is so far beyond really? so many people that it, it almost seems absurd that we're even proposing that idea because the cost of living is difficult. Mm. It's high. The mm. cost of hand slaughtered products because of the human element of literally hand slaughtering labor. something yeah the labor costs are higher all of these factors ultimately turn into the uh the dollar and and, and and influence the cost of the good and that's a challenge that everybody has and then you get into issues of like sustainability and and i mean and not only sustainable from a point of from the consumption vantage point of view because like you said higher cost means i have to pay more for a, you know a slab of that's meat right. than i would if i go to the local supermarket where maybe i'm not so uh, i'm not so concerned about those type of certifications and and what have you so but also sustainability from the vantage point of like sustainable grazing sustainable li- livestock etc all the things that come through the food cycle that relate to sustainability. So yeah, I mean, it's yeah. a, it's a real challenge. I, yeah. I, and I imagine it, it's, it's something not, a, not unlike what you're, what you're finding is, vis-a-vis Muslim health or sorry, uh, mental health issues in the Muslim community. Uh, these are conver- it's like a maturation process, mm-hmm. conversations around yeah. this. Yeah. Like the, wh- the term that comes to mind yeah. on all of this is we've come a long way. Right. Absolutely. We've come yeah. a long way. Absolutely. And things have certainly changed. I mean, just if we look at the, timeline of when Hafsa began till now, absolutely, there's been a great more of education that's happening. Even just earlier, you said, you know, understanding why do people, why are packages labeled as Zabiha versus labeled as Halal? Why is there a differentiation in these labels? What What is the yeah. end goal of doing things like that, right? Yeah. Like, what do people try to get to, you know? So, I think, I think the challenge is, is that the more education that we're able to provide to the communities, the yeah. more we're able to bring awareness, that's the goal. Allow okay. people to make informed decisions as opposed to, you know, I hate to put it this way, but playing on people's sincerity because it's not your local grocery store, his fault. It's not, you know, you know the, the local imam who doesn't know know any different. It's really sort of the people at the higher echelon of management who know what they're doing in marketing, in branding, who know that, you know, we can slap on a halal label on this and still sell a product. I mean, one of the worst incidents or stories that I can share about here in the Bay Area is, is that there, and I won't mention any names, but there was a store in the early 90s, which was one of the first few 
halal meat markets in the Bay Area. And everybody used to buy their meat from there. And, um, and the reason was because they said that we buy it from a brother who is a Muslim brother and he slaughters the chicken himself. So there's a guy who I know till this very day, he's a very uh, old friend. He told me, he was the one telling me the story. He said, so I heard this, this, this guy's telling me the yeah. story. He's saying that, so I was, I wanted to go thank that guy, that whoever this guy is, you're providing halal meat for the entire Muslim community because there was only one halal meat market. Mm -hmm. Right. I, whoever you are, I just want to go and meet him and just thank him and just see what is he doing. Yeah. So he travels, he finds the name of the company, he finds the name of the brand, the farm. He leaves one morning around four o'clock in the morning because it was a four hour drive, finds the plant and it's an old white couple who run this farm. So he says, hey, I'm looking for brother Omar. So the white couple is a little bit confused. So like, here's our plant manager's uh, number. Why don't you go ahead and get, get in touch with him? So he gets a hold of him and he goes and he meets him and he sees this plant manager. And he goes, hey, my name is so-and-so. I'm just a community member. I wanted to thank uh, Brother Omar for providing halal meat for the Muslim community for the past six, seven years yeah. um, because he's the only meat market. So the guy, the plant manager, and this is the guy who's supposed to know everything and everyone. He says, who? He says, yeah, Brother Omar. He goes, Brother Omar, I don't, and he's confused. He's like, Brother Omar, Omar, and he's going through his records, and he ends up finding that there was a custom order that was placed by a guy named Omar years ago mm -hmm. for a type of halal product that he slaughtered, but it was a very large order. And uh, it, I, I don't know what it was for, but it was a large yeah. order. And essentially, he sold out of everything. He had leftover. This plant manager had leftover from Omar's order. And he ended up selling it with the same label that Omar purchased and said, put a halal la label on it. So he had leftovers. And when he sold it, he sold so much that they kept printing the label. And so for wow. years, and this person who'd relayed the story said at least seven years, this same product was being shared and sold yeah. in the community, labeled halal. And there's no such thing as Brother Omar. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. you know, this is just one of those <laughs> sort of uh, horror stories that it keeps me motivated right. to ensure that I can keep doing what I do. And I'm very proud of the fact that an organization like Hafsa exists to be able to give us the assurity to go into a store, not ask any questions, and know that I can eat anything off the menu. And I think that that's the lesson. I mean, not only the anecdote, but I mean, I mean, and I was even thinking about this before you mentioned the anecdote is, you know, what's the lesson here in terms of, or the takeaway, should we be better consumers? I think, I think that's the key, right? Because at the end of the day, I mean, if you believe in the free market, you know, if the consumer demands that the meat is Hapsa certified or demands a certain level of due diligence, from where they're purchasing their meat or consuming their food, that would drive businesses to ensure that they meet those standards. And I'll share just I mean, one. Is that, would you agree with that? Sort totally of assessment? agree with that. And especially in America, that's, right. I would say that's, that's, that's all the of model. It. That's exactly it. As opposed to the sort of top down. Exactly. Right? Because yeah. there's no, there's no reason for the top down model. There you no go. No one cares about you. Other than it being consumer driven. That's right. And right. I think that's a hard point to hit home when people get mad and say, how come, you know, certain, you know, food items aren't halal or certain. And I'm like, I know you're upset, but you're directing this anger in the wrong way. Misdirected. The guy totally. who owns this franchise doesn't care about you and I. Right. So when we say, why isn't in and out halal, you're, you're getting mad at the imams for the wrong reason. The imams is just telling you what it is. <laughs> if you're mad that in and out doesn't have halal meat, go and have 10,000 Muslims right. write a letter to in and out and say, hey, guys, make one store halal. Right? Yeah. But I'll end on this one note. And I'll just share this one thing about Hafsa. And, yeah. and I know we're probably going to wrap it, but... We talked about the demand and what the community can push for and what they can get as a result. I, I first and foremost want to thank Imam Khalid Latif, a base out of NYU, oh, yeah. specifically because honest chops, right? Uh, honest chops, <laughs> that's right, right? Uh, oh, certified, yeah, right? So right. the the interesting thing about Imam Khalid Latif is is that he saw that there was a demand in the community for halal food at NYU. Uh, on campus. Okay. And he was one of the driving forces behind finding halal certification because he said, we demand it. We want it. We have thousands of Muslims or hundreds, yeah, thousands of Muslims at NYU, downtown Manhattan. If we want to provide for our Muslim students and other Muslim, and other students as well, we need to have an option. And he really, really pushed this forward, ultimately leading to NYU having the first fully certified halal dining halls in the country. And 
everything in their dining hall at Lipton Hall is Hufsa certified. It's a fantastic buffet style uh, facility. Um, there is an on-site inspector. All the products are vetted and verified. It made the news. It was a very big deal. But that's what we can demand when the community sort of gets together and says, look, we are not settling for you know, the, the the people in the back telling us halal means that it's clean. This is not for you to define for us what halal means, right? Nice. And, and anybody yeah. in New York can go, right? Anyone in New York can so go. So listeners, if you're, if, you're in, if you're in Manhattan, <laughs> go check, go, go to NYU's uh, Lipton Hall. <laughs> That's right. Go to NYU's Lipton Hall and you'll see. I was going to propose that as our next road trip, Omar. <laughs> <laughs> Lipton Hall I, it is, man. I have a funny story about Honest Chops. I, I walked like five, we, my friends and I were there and we walked like five miles looking for it, but we had Googled, Google mapped the, the butchery instead of the, the burger place. So that was, a, that's how I remember that <laughs> mm. specifically. But anyway. So alhamdulillah, yeah. you know, and that's just kind of, the, the idea just goes back to this, that if, if, we, if, we, if we pull together mm -hmm. our resources and we demand it, because at the end of the day, it's our money that speaks yeah, right if we demand it overnight this country would shift for us mm -hmm. and i think people think america's too big actually it seems like this is almost like scary impossible how could i compete no it's not about that it's just a matter of like if we had 10 masjids get together in fremont and said we would never we will not accept anything other than hand slaughtered tomorrow you would see the market change i don't want to get too political but i mean we find ourselves in june and i so <laughs> I, I, I i would have to make this sort of comparison you have you know less than one percent of the population and you have corporations who go full pride for months mm. not just July, not just june so you know consumer c consumers can drive behavior from corporations yep. and i mean i'm not saying that that's a that's by any means like something that we need to follow or emulate but nonetheless it speaks to that idea at least that numbers don't matter as much as you know the squeaky wheel as they say gets the you know gets grease, the grease or the what grease, have you yeah 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 so um and you see that you see that yeah. on social media right twitter doesn't <laughs> so a, a, a small number of people can make a lot of noise on twitter Absolutely. and all of a sudden companies right. are changing their tune that's right but that's right. Uh, anyway hey you know yeah. I, one thing i i've gotten to know you a bit in the past couple months first when we got together for the first time <laughs> and now today uh, yeah. but I, you know i really appreciate like your energy yeah and that you actually take that energy and passion and put it into something tangible yeah. that actually benefits the community. So I, I really appreciate that about you. For sure. Know. And I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm certainly, you know, you know, um, older vintage than you are, Jabber. But I mean, yeah, I think that energy is contagious. And, and you know, the idea of like being inspired by something and, and just really just dedicating time and, and resources to understanding it or studying it to its fullest. I mean, I think anybody listening to the interview takes that away from you. So I, I, I want to thank you for that as well and kind of echo what Omer said. But, um, any sort of imparting thoughts as you as we wrap? No, this has been fantastic. I feel like I've shared so much. And if you keep giving me time on the mic, it's just going to keep going. And so <laughs> no, well, no. We, we can do that and we, definitely bring you back. <laughs> definitely. You're, you're you're local local and it, it was my pleasure and yeah. I, I appreciate this. And um, I think it's just very exciting to see what the future holds inshallah. because there's been so much progress and so much growth. And I just pray that inshallah, Allah makes me part of that success, inshallah. I mean, I mean, and, and so two things we often like to ask. Uh, so one, you know, where can people engage you, reach out to you? And then number two, any sort of projects and work that you're involved with that you want to maybe um, tell others about? Certainly, yeah. So I think uh, reaching me directly yeah. is um, Instagram. So okay. there's a social media. It's just my name, Jabber Taren. And uh, you can find it on, so on Instagram. You can find me there. Um, and, then and then folks can DM you and, and that's right. Yeah. You. So you can contact me there and okay. then through mental health, the mental health outlet is through Wasila connections. If you ever need to make a religious consultation or actually do therapy services, it's just Wasila connections.org. Um, if you need to reach me in terms of any other religious questions, Masjid Al Huda is my base. That's where I'm at. It's in union city with Hafsa same. I mean, I guess I'm just a, a pushing all the organizations no, no, please but, do yeah you know again via the website you just go on hafsa.org and you can reach me there um and the current projects some of the things that i'm uh, actively working on is you know we just completed a prophetic manliness program mm. where we actually did so an amazing um event doing um exploring 
prophetic manliness as it relates to physical strength. Oh, so we did an entire session with a great group, uh, close to 40 young men came to this uh, Muslim uh, wrestling gym based out of Hayward United Wrestling Club. Awesome. And it was fantastic. We had an amazing so um, program there. So we're continuing this work. So follow us on social media, follow Wasila Connections, stay in touch with us. If you or anybody you know would love to be a part of this, we'd love to have you get in touch with us, stay oh. in touch with us. The had next I known event. that, yeah, you know, had I known your involvement, I mean, I think that's a that that is something I've really wanted to, to, to talk about on the show for so long. So, inshallah, we'll definitely. Yeah, have you I back think that's it because Perez, that. you and I were just talking about no, like, and and even earlier when you were talking about um, you know influencers and so on, I couldn't help but think of Andrew Tate and the yeah. sort of market that's out there for consuming that type of content and and how I, there's a real void. I yeah. think this is a chance to bring you back to talk about prophetic masculinity. Yeah. I think that in, in and of itself is. Uh, uh, is the reason well the to next, the next what, I'll, what i'll do is i'll invite y you and any listeners to who are i guess local to the bay area yeah. the, the next event inshallah we do plan to have is in <clears throat> end of august so around end of august time um is generally when the, okay. the next one is scheduled we normally do them quarterly so since we just did it the next one we'll do it will be around august so be sure to follow us there on social Definitely. media so you don't miss okay. the alert yeah, plan yeah, on no. it inshallah and, and you know I, I've, I've had conversations and i've reached out you know separately with to imam Dawood walid who i'm sure you're familiar with in his book and the work he's done behind that so it's so 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 needed and i say that as a father of two daughters so i don't have like necessarily directly a a you know a, a sort of a, a dog in the race but i mean obviously you know, my daughters are eventually going to marry young Muslim men, inshallah, God willing. And, and, so and hey, we're still evolving too, right? So <laughs> there right. you go. So but, uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Jabber. Um, and uh, yeah, folks, uh, feel free to reach out to Jabber if you want to engage him further. But inshallah, God willing, we'll have him back on the show. Uh, as always, thank you for listening. If you have any thoughts, feedback, questions, you can reach us at diffusecongruence at gmail.com. Hit us up on Twitter, social media. You can always reach out. Um, what I said at the outset and on the behalf of both me and Omer, apologize for the delay in getting this episode to you, but we have a really busy summer. So Omer and I are going to be hitting the road uh, coming up in July. We're going to be going to Chicago and we're going to be recording a slew of episodes there with some of the locals really excited about. And so promise to be a very, very productive summer as far as the podcast goes. And as always, thank you for listening. Catch us on the next episode of Diffuse Congruence.